Oh, and also, usually what will then also happen is you'll then complain like, oh, Michelle is so mean. I, I brought well, he'll grade it. I'm harsher than Michelle is. I'm like, you know, right now. Like, I had people last semester who complained about their lab instructors, and they're like, oh, yeah, we'll get him. He'll change. He's nice. And I read it as like, I, yeah, I, I would have lowered your score. You, you don't want me to score this. So don't wait on the paper. Don't, don't wait. It will be the, it's the single thing that will lower your grade faster than anything else is that lab paper. Especially because it's roughly 15% of your overall grade. There's nothing yet in the entire class. It is half of your lab score shows up in one assignment. We do not have an assignment in this class that weighs more than that one single paper. 10%. So it's 100 points. That paper is 140. Just saying. So today uh, we're going to talk sequencing, genomes, and probes. We're going to see if we can get to those probes. The ideas are pretty simple about sequencing. I got rid of some stuff that normally we would talk about, but we're missing a week anyway, so whatever's. The one thing that if we get to it, and I'm hoping we get to it today, is probes. Probes just kind of mess with your brain. Just because there's, there's just something strange about the probes. So in terms of resources, hooray and a hip hip. Long questions. We will definitely get to the first one. Hopefully we'll get to the second one. The short questions are pretty simple. I told you about that. So with recombination frequencies, we can put genes in order. That's the best we can do. So using recombination frequencies, we can kind of sort of put genes in a relative order. We can take guesses as to how far apart they are. So the way you would do this is a whole bunch of three-point test crosses. So if I keep doing three-point test cross after three-point test cross after three-point test cross after three-point test cross, I can eventually compare enough genes that I can put them into order. If I can then see if there's reference between looking at staining patterns on chromosomes and things going wrong, what I can attempt to do is connect the three-point test crosses with what I see on a chromosome in terms of the banding patterns. Meaning, oh, whenever this band seems to disappear, I get this phenotype. And that phenotype, I can do three-point test crosses on. And whenever I don't get this phenotype, I don't see this banding pattern. So the result is I can start to assemble these maps. The maps usually are not super accurate. They'll get the order right. The order will be right, but how far away the genes are, they're, they're not particularly trustworthy. In order to help us fact check these things, what we could also do is look for other bits and pieces, genetic pieces of code that don't necessarily manifest easily in a three-point test cross. So those things we have not talked about, although in lab you have, namely we can look for SNPs and we can see how certain SNPs might link to particular traits. We can look for things called stirs, short, short has a T, tandem, repeats. So we're just looking for repeats of like C A C A C A C A. And by short, the sequence is short, and you have a handful of them. It turns out that depending on where you look for these, the locus of a stir. We will vary in how many we have. Meaning at spot number one, short tandem repeats. Meaning at spot number one, locus number one, I might have three. You might have four. We can use those to tell us apart. Rifflip, a great one. A rifflip is a restriction fragment length. 
all imports result. So we haven't dealt with the technology needed for this, but basically what you do is you take a gene, you run it through PCR, take DNA, get a PCR product, and then you digest it with enzymes. And some of us, we will get different size fragments because some of us will cut the PCR product and some of us won't. Meaning, as an example, I can get one fragment and in person one, it will break into two pieces when it's digested, but in person two, it stays the same length. So we can now start to tell individuals apart. But we know that this thing, this variable area, exists. So I can stick it inside of a map. So when we make these three-point test cross maps, this is based upon some obvious phenotype. But we can do the exact same thing using DNA sequences. We can do the exact same thing looking at A's, T's, C's, and G's which means we can switch away from all this classical genetic stuff that drives everyone crazy, and we can go back to the world of A's, T's, C's, and G's. To get that order of A's, T's, C's, and G's, we need to have a sequencing technique. The most famous of all the sequencing techniques is referred to as Sanger sequencing. He has two Nobel Prizes. The reason why he has two Nobel Prizes is he first figured out how to do this in proteins, then he figured out how to do it in nucleic acids. So he's the one who came up with how to sequence the two variable macromolecules. So the basic version of DNA sequencing, again, is referred to as Sanger sequencing, and it's completely and totally based on DNA replication. The goal, or when you replicate DNA, if you remember, and it's been a while, it's been nine weeks, is you need to have a free three prime OH. That three prime OH is essential for DNA replication. It's what's needed for transcription. So the question then becomes, what if that 3 prime OH is missing? What would happen if I blocked that 3 prime OH from existing? The result is a termination. That type of base where we can terminate, meaning force DNA replication to stop. Doesn't matter what, if the sequence is supposed to stop replicating or not, it will stop because I put this base in. These are referred to as dideoxyribonucleotide triphosphates, or DDNTPs. There's the di, meaning two. This is deoxy meaning no oxygen. So what will happen is if I were to throw in, if I were to take PCR, so for the PCR I need to add in your genomic DNA, I'll have a primer I'm going to throw in DNTPs because I need to replicate. But I'm going to throw in a small subset. A small amount of DDNTPs. What this will do, this chunk right here, is cause random 
terminations. Meaning, if I were to make this as a line, and you have all your DNA, so this is your DNA that I'm drawing out. What would happen is, if I let this replicate, in one case, it might make it that far, and then, oops, termination. There's a DDNTP. Darn, it stopped. Maybe on the second one, it made it this far. Oops, DDNTP was put in. Stopped. Third one, it didn't even make it that far. Oops, stopped. Fourth one, we made it to the end. Good for us. DDNTP stopped. Then you'll, we can have all these other options. What we get is when we run through the PCR, we're going to stop at random points because we're going to put in the terminator, a DDNTP. So it's replicating, it's replicating, it's replicating, and then ha! We break the system. But another piece of your DNA is replicating, 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 and stop. Then a different piece of your DNA is replicating, 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 stop. And where they stop is going to depend on when this dideoxynucleotide shows up. It's not being forced in, it just randomly associates. And when it shows up, we end. If I were to take all these pieces, these red chunks, and if I were to line them up in order of smallest to biggest, what I would get is something that collectively would look like this. where each of these turns out to be the stop. Well, if I knew what each of those circles turned out to be, I have the sequence. I would know the first nucleotide, then the second, then the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth, however many I need to go. I get the order. So how do I tell the nucleotides apart? Well, let's just add color. Let's add, just to make this a little bit easier on us, a colored tag onto the base. So onto these DDNTPs, we're going to add a color. In particular, it's going to be a fluorescence tag. And all I have to do is see what the colors are. So how do we get the sequence? So we run our PCR. We have your DNA, the source. We add a primer because we have to give it a starting point. We add NTPs to let it replicate but we throw in some terminators, and we're hoping that this will happen enough that if I were to run these in order from smallest to biggest, I can get the order of the bases. The way that we would detect it is we just do gel electrophoresis. You've done this. If I were to take my entire sample of this PCR and just run it into a gel, what I should see it would be a very boring gel to look at, but I would just see a whole bunch of lines. Where each of those lines would be a separate length. And if I could figure out how to read what each of those lines was, I got it. Because that would be really difficult to read, 
And basically, everything I was describing is right here. So we just get these random stops. What we're going to do is instead of running this through a gel, like what we did in lab, we're going to run it in a vertical gel. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have a real, so I'm going to have a machine, and in it is going to be a really skinny gel. I'm going to load my sample up at the top. And when it gets turned on, pieces are going to move down. As they move down, if you remember in lab, we said, uh-oh, we need to stop it before your samples ran into like the next area or it ran right off your gel. We're not going to do that in this case. We want them to run off of the gel. So what we're going to have way down here at the bottom is we're going to have a detector. And what it's going to look for is the light that passes right through the beam. What it's going to look for is it's going to detect the light of the DDNTPs. So when the first piece moves past, the terminator is going to have light. And it's going to pick up the light. And it's going to remember what the light was. Then the next piece comes by. It will have a color. It's going to pick up what the color is. The third one comes by. It's going to pick up what the color is. The fourth one comes by. It will pick up what the color is. And it will repeat this over and over and over again until we ran out of sample. What are the colors, you ask? Those are the colors. Universally, A is associated as green. A ready orange is going to be T. C is going to be green. That's not green, that's blue. Technically, G is yellow, is the color that's used, but yellow doesn't show up really pretty when you make a graph out of it, so we false color it as black. In the actual reaction, it's yellow. Yep. It just picks up. Here's the color that shows up. That's all it does. And it just remembers the order. Oh, so what's the order of the colors? It went blue, red, red, green, yellow, red, blue, blue, yellow, yellow, red, green, green, blue. And it just keeps track of the colors. And each color corresponds with the nucleotide at the end of the run. So all I have to do is put them back in order. The first one that shows up is the smallest piece, which means that must be the starting nucleotide. The last one to show up terminated at the very end which means that was the largest piece. So we know it has to be the end. The way that we assemble the picture is called a chromatogram. So it's a picture of colors, literally what chromatogram means. Again, smallest fragment shows up first, the largest is the last. This is what the process would look like that I attempted to describe. If this turns out to be your actual sequence, we run it through that sequencing PCR. All the blue blocks would be it assembled normally. These colored ends are our way of saying it terminated too soon. The colors are incorrect. Get rid of, we'll get past that. What we then do is run this through electrophoresis. Smallest piece shows up first, largest piece shows up last. So if I could see the colors as they went down the gel, it would just be a series of band colors. This is actually too, they're too close to each other that we could not visualize it. It would just be a big smear of color. 
So we couldn't see it. So our gels that we used in lab are not used in this because they don't do a good enough job. What we typically will use is something called um, polyacrylamide. Polyacrylamide is toxic. You have to make it in a fume hood while wearing a mask because if you breathe it in, it causes cancer. But it's good enough to separate out pieces of DNA. What the detector will do is make a picture that looks like this. They're usually not given to you in vertical form. They're usually horizontal. So in, so in, so this week we're doing three-point test crosses. Next week we're going to do transcription data. Week after that, there's no lab. And for those of you who are in the Thursday lab, people in my Friday lab, raise your hands. All of you owe them money because they're the reason why you don't have lab on Thursday. So all of you owe them. The week afterwards, so this is going to be the week before Thanksgiving, you have a draft of your paper due, and that's going to be the only time you get feedback, but we're also going to analyze sequences, so you'll see actual sequence data. It's sequences from me, so it's actually my DNA that you're going to be analyzing. But you will see these peaks. Your goal, if you ever have to sequence DNA, is you want peaks that are nice and clean by themselves, and you don't want anything really else by it, you'll see that all of these would turn out to be numbered. So it'd say like one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. And it's a nice, clean way of seeing, oh, I can trust my DNA sequence. This is the way gels used to be run. They actually were done, this was before we had the ability to detect the fluorescence. So what you would do is you would run the PCR reaction four times. Each time had a different terminator in it, and they were radioactive. So you have one that has a radioactive G, one with a C, one with an A, one with a T. You would load them into a gel and run it all at the exact same time. And then you would just read the sequence. You would take your gel once it's done, totally radioactive, you take a piece of radio film, so something that's reactive to radio or x-rays, put it on top, let it sit there and soak, peel the thing off, and you just read the bands in order from the bottom to the top. So what would this sequence be? It would be A, T, A, 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 C, T, C, A, G, blah, blah, blah. We don't do it this way anymore. Why? Because x-rays. Who wants to deal with x-rays? Also, the gel to do this, so when I was an undergraduate, because I'm old, I, had, I knew someone who did sequencing, because we lucked out that we had a sequencer. The gel, crap you not, would be take these two tables, them side by side. Yeah, that's the size of the gel. The gel itself is about the thickness of a sheet of paper. So what you had to do is mix up the solution while it was still hot, rush on over to where the sequencer was. You had to pour it into this gel, so it was within like this vacuum chamber. Pour it on in, and then you had to get it so it spread throughout the entire gel, because if it didn't spread everywhere, it wasn't going to work. So you had to get about 10 people and you had to start pounding on the table to try and force this liquid to fill up the entire space and get all the bubbles out. Because if you had one bubble, then kiss that lane goodbye. And you had to start over. It took usually about half a day just to make the gel. Nowadays, you run the reaction, pull it out, pipette it into a machine, sit, go, go, drink coffee, come on back, look at the printout on the computer, and you say, thank you. It used to be a massive pain in the butt. So let's draw this old-fashioned Sanger sequencing. So what I would do to demonstrate how this would work, so that's the sequence. 
Remember that we always replicate onto the three into an exposed three prime end. So everything I'm going to be drawing is going to be backwards. So the five prime end I'm going to put on the left, three prime end on the right. So the first piece I would end up seeing here. Uh, let's make sure I have all the colors I need. We'll do black. Da, da, da. I'll do the default as, no, I'm going to do it as gray. So on the five prime end, what would show up first? C would show up first. What color is C? Blue. This would be my terminator. So how would I show that it's a terminator? Put DD in front of it. I know it sounds like there's a bug dying in there or something. No, because if we're going and sequencing, the first one that would actually pop up would be the C. You would put in the primer to say, make me that sequence. So only thing that we need to label is the left is going to be the five prime. If you do that, then we know that the other side's the three prime. So what would come next? Well, the C would be by itself, and it would have replicated. The next to pop in would have been G. You're now being confused because you're like, no, the next one is a T. No, it's not. You're reading it backwards. The next would be A, then C, then T, A, A, C, G, G, T, C. It's reading it correctly. So we weren't told that that's the template. If we were using that, if I told you that's the template, then we would go accordingly. But if I'm told that's the sequence, then let's make the sequence. The next one would be G, and this would be a terminator, so DD. What would come next? C, G, then. A, A, I believe is green. And we would repeat this over and over and over again. So let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. After a while, you get the point. Let's speed it up. G, 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 A, 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 A. Next one after that is going to be a C. C, 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 C. Now it'll be T, 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 A, 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 A. A, 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 C, 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 G, 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 T. I'm off by one. One, two, three, four, five, six. Did I count this incorrectly? That's three, six, and 12. Eh, we'll make it work. So there should be 12. Eh. When I fill it in, we'll see where I made my mistake. So we have C, G, A. Next one is going to be a C. Next one after that is going to be a T. Next one after that is going to be an A. Then we'll have an A. Then we'll get a C. Then I'll get a G. Then I'll get a T. Then I'll get G. C, G, A, C, 
T A A C G. Ah, that's why, because I skipped. Another G. I have a T. Then I get a C. That'd be the entire sequence. Would they be made in that order? So if you can't read it because the light's showing up, all these grays are just matching what's above. Why, is, why do I have the gray being gray? Because it doesn't have a tag. It has no color to it whatsoever. So again, is this the order in which these would have been synthesized? No. What is the order? We have no clue. These would be randomly made, meaning the first replication round could have made this one right here, and the second replication could have made this one, and the third replication could have made this one, and the fourth could have made this first one. Because where the terminator gets incorporated is random. But if it gets incorporated, it has to be the end. You all have puzzled looks. Ask. Oh, yeah. Like on your homework, you're going to be asked to do this, and it has to be with the right color. Because otherwise, it's not correct. Just letting you know. If there's color, you need to include color. So would I put this on a quiz or the final? It'd be a short question. Would I ask you to draw all this out? No. Why? Because this takes way too long. Way too long to draw it all out. But could you interpret a picture? Or if I gave you the sequence, could you draw me what the chromatogram looks like? That should be easy. Or even easier, can you read the chromatogram and tell me what the sequence is? So let's do that. Let's make the chromatogram. So this will end up going through the gel. We'll have our detector at the end as the sequences move down. And what it will end up doing is give us a series of peaks. The first one to show up bless you, is going to be a C. The next one to show up would be a G. Next one to show up would be an A. Then we'd have a C. Then we would have a T. Then we get two A's in a row. Then you would get a C. You get two G's a T, and then a C. And they're read in the order that they're presented. C, 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 G, 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 A, 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 T, T. The picture you would interpret would be this. The higher the peak, the cleaner the peak. The smaller it is, there's not as much of it there. Ideally, you would see one color per peak. If you see two colors present, that means that there was some ambiguity with what was put in. Meaning, if I saw this, actually it wouldn't be that high be like that, or I had a C, but also a whole lot of T present, we actually wouldn't even say what it is. We would take a guess, and what we'd actually probably write is a Y. Y for pyrimidine. I see C and I see T, and I don't know which one's supposed to win, so I'm not going to take a guess. So there's a lot of information that we can gather from a picture. Let's go back to the original. 
How we doing? This is nice. It, it, it only works for like a couple hundred bases, and then it doesn't work anymore. Because you can only keep detecting for so long. So we want to sequence the human genome. Human genome has three billion nucleotides. Using this technique here, it'd probably take a couple of years of everyday running gels. And then you have to be running gels in parallel to like fact check yourself. So this is gonna be stupid. So we invented a new way to do this. Called NGS. NGS stands for Next Generation Sequencing. If you need to have large chunks of DNA or sequenced, we don't use Sanger sequencing. If you need short ones, sure, Sanger sequencing works just fine. But if you want genes sequenced, or chromosomes sequenced, or genome sequenced, we do not use Sanger sequencing. It takes too long. It is too slow. So what we're going to use is what's known as a shotgun approach. So next generation sequencing, this is the phenomenon that made it so famous. What we're going to do is we're going to take the genome and we literally explode it into chunks. Some of these chunks overlap. Some of them are going to be practically identical. Some of them are going to be totally different. What I'm going to do is blow it up into a whole bunch of different pieces. And I'm going to sequence all of them at the exact same time. So I'm not going to do one piece at a time. I'm going to do, let's blow the entire thing up and then sequence all of our fragments at the exact same time. That's massively parallel sequencing. We're going to do all the parts at the exact same time. None of this one at a time junk. What we're then going to do is we're going to look at where we had repeats, meaning this chunk and this chunk overlap. And if they overlap, Oh, we can keep and put these two sequences together. So I have these chunks that have overlaps on them, where re meaning this chunk and this chunk here repeat with each other. So if I can align them, snap them together. Take these two pieces here. Oh, they have this part in, re in the same. Snap them together. And if I do this over and over and over with all of my pieces, I can assemble a genome. This is only done by computer. You do not do this by hand. You do not do this by you looking at the sequences. This is all done by computer. The guy who came up with this approach, J. Craig Venter, who helped push the Human Genome Project faster than it definitely was going to get done, as they finished it in like two years, and they were expecting it to take like a decade or more. And the reason why it was done so quickly is because he thought of this approach, thought of a Nobel Prize. He, he just retired. He's a multi, 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 multi millionaire. Because all sequencing technology that has come since has all sprung forth from his one idea. There are... Th but So it depends on how it's going to be done. So you could Sanger sequence each of these. You could, but Sanger sequencing requires you to know a little bit about what you're sequencing. And we have no clue. We just, it's, it'd be me going and taking, a book was just released. That's a compilation of seven other books. It's about this thick, and it's the complete Harry Potter series as one book. It's like 3,500 pages long. So what, Sanger sequen or what Next Gen Sequencing would be is I'm going to take this, 
and I'm going to run the thing through a random paper shredder. It's not going to shred in lines, but it's going to randomly just cut up pages. But what we're going to do is give you all the fragments of the pages, and then you need to reassemble it. Well, if I don't have any idea of like page numbers and stuff like that, like it's impossible to reassemble it. So I need to have some starting points, and Singer sequencing requires that. These don't necessarily require you to have prior knowledge about what you're doing. So these three, the point isn't going to be to memorize exactly how they work. It's going to be, oh, different takes on the same problem. Illumina is probably the most famous. And Illumina does something called SBS. SBS is sequence by synthesis. So for them to do their job, what they're going to create are these things called flow cells. So it's going to be a, a gene chip. Gene chips, if you've never seen what a gene chip looks like. I used to have one, and I have no clue what I did with it. But they're literally the size of like these old-fashioned thumb drives. They're about this big. And what you'll have on these, because if you look, yeah, it's matching, is on it, there's going to be tiny holes on there. Those holes are what we call clusters. And what you're going to do, they have to synthesize these things for you. So you can't just, oh, let me go buy one of these and make it work. The company needs to do this for you. So it's not necessarily cheap. What they're going to do on each of those little circles is they're going to make a cluster of single-stranded DNA. So your DNA, they're going to denature it so it's single-stranded, and they're going to attach clusters of them. Each cluster, or the contents of the clusters are identical, meaning inside this first cluster, everything is the same. Inside of this cluster, everything is going to be the same, but one and two do not match. They might overlap, but they do not match. Three is going to be identical. Is going everything in three is going to be identical. Everything in four is going to be identical. And you're going to do this a couple hundred times inside of this little chip. The way they do that is explained here. It actually does a weird replication process, and then they break them apart. We don't care. Each of these little clusters, each of those circles, is going to be good for about 1,500 bases. That's not that great. Yeah. But like I said, you could put a couple hundred, if not a couple thousand, of these clusters onto that chip. So it's now a couple hundred to a couple thousand times a thousand bases each. Oh, well, this becomes a slightly different story. Now we actually have a whole lot of data in one spot. The sequence by synthesis is going to be a manipulation of that termination. So the way Singer sequencing worked is we have to know the stopping point. And we had to run this a whole bunch of times and then figure out the order of them. Illumina, that's the name of the company, they said, we can do you one better. We don't, we're not going to wait till the end. What we're going to do is replicate and figure it out as we go. So it's going to detect during the replication process. And that's what the sequence by synthesis is. So what they're going to add in, in their particular case, let's draw a picture, is they're going to add in a brand new nucleotide. So here's our new nucleotide that was just added in. On the three prime end, There's going to be a phosphate. We can't replicate. We stopped termination, or we stopped replication. And this phosphate is going to have a color associated with it. So it's going to have a fluorophore. So what I'm going to do is add in my next nucleotide, add it. It has an N. Let's take a photo of the colors we see. 
So we add the color. We can detect the color. Next step is we're going to add a phosphatase. You know what phosphatases do? Removes phosphates. When you remove the phosphate, you're left with a 3 prime OH. Which then means add a new DNTP. And when we do that, it's also going to have a phosphate terminator with a color. So then let's detect the color and repeat. So each time we add a new nucleotide, let's take a photo, chop off the color, add a new nucleotide, take a photo of the color, chop off the color, add a new nucleotide. Why do we need to chop off the phosphate? Because the phosphate's stopping the replication, so you don't get more than one replication round at a time. Also, since the color is associated with the phosphate, when I get rid of the phosphate, I'm starting with no color again. So I don't need to worry about how colors add up or anything weird like that. It's just a series of photos, a series of colors. That's it. And what you could do is take these colored photos from each of those clusters so from every single cluster, we're going to have a series of these photos. So in cluster number one, I'm going to get a series of 1,000 photos. Cluster two, I'll get a series of 1,000 photos. And they're not going to be the same. Same thing with cluster three, four, five, however many there are. Each of those is giving me a sequence. So basically, I'm running this a couple hundred at the exact same time. But there's something also being built in, which is also kind of tricky. I showed you before, like the C could also maybe have had a T associated with it. It screws up what we see. Each of these still has color, and they all turn out to be unique colors. So I should see pure color in each of the clusters. And if I don't, it's a way of saying, oh, maybe there's a little bit of variability going on here. Maybe it wasn't a clean read, and we could just replicate that part again. The colors tell us what the bases are every time you take a photo. And if we have mixtures of colors, it tells us, oh, maybe we need to redo just this one cluster. It's a way of fact-checking. It's a way of verifying. It's a validation point that it's a good clean sequence. There's a problem with this, and that is you can't do it. You, you need them to do it for you. And it's not cheap. Sanger sequencing is cheap because it's old tech. So can we do better? The answer is yes. Pacific Biosystems. No one calls them Pacific Biosystems. We call them PacBio. They use a very clever variation on all of this. So they're going to utilize what are called ZMWs. Hi. Which are called zero mode waveforms. What they're going to have is a plate kind of like what we saw before, so thing the size of a flash drive. And what we're going to have in this plate are going to be itty bitty wells. Much, much smaller than what we had before. In terms of dimensions of these wells, because I looked it up to write it down, these are going to be 100 nanometers by 70 nanometers. Insanely 
freakishly small, tiny holes. That if you were to calculate the volume of this well, it's going to be 20 zeptoliters. That's not that that's not a that's not a root. That that's not a metric thing. The answer is yes, it is. It's on the small side. On the these, no one ever needs to know list. It's a freakishly small volume. Okay, then let's turn it into liters. That is not right. Oh, that's because it's uh, something on the order of like 2 times 10 to the minus 20 liters. Something like that. I'm looking at what I wrote. It's like, nope, that is not the right number. Yeah, it's something like 2 to the minus 20, which are, again, freakishly small numbers. Like, you're making stuff up at this point. So what we do in this particular case, again, we're going to take a theme off of Illumina and we're just going to say, haha, I can do you one better, is at the bottom of each of these wells, we're going to have an RNA polymerase, or excuse me, a DNA polymerase. But it's going to be stuck on the bottom. So that's what we mean by tethered. So a tethered DNA polymerase is it's stuck on the bottom. And what we're going to do is if you feed it in DNA, it helps if it's single-stranded, so you just denature it. You put in single-stranded DNA, place it on in, and it's going to then synthesize the other side. The catch is, so we'll add in DNT or DNTPs, and we'll synthesize. Double-stranded DNA. So what we do to make this so we can detect it is just kind of like with Illumina, When you look at the bases of alumina, we added a phosphate onto this end, and we added the color here. And that's how we did our detection. Then we chopped off the color. With PAC Bio, what we're going to do in this case, what, what made this so smart is it's a chain terminator. Then we had to chop it off. So we had to like add an extra step. What if we don't need to add this extra step? What if I take this phosphate that's colored, and let's just stick it up here, where we already have phosphates that need to be chopped off anyway. And that's what they do with PacBio. We still have our OH, phosphate, phosphate, phosphate. Let's just add color to the last phosphate. So when the next nucleotide gets incorporated, if I shine a beam of light directly at where I have that DNA polymerase, so if I detect at the right spot, I'm only looking at a certain location, which is where the new nucleotide is added in, what I can do is when the new nucleotide shows up, I see the color of the nucleotide that was just added. But when we go to actually incorporate it, we snip it off, and the color goes away. And then, so if we have this yellow one come on in, the C is incorporated, I see when I'm looking directly at this active site, the nucleotide was just added. Oops, we just snipped off the phosphate, because it was just incorporated. We now bring in the next nucleotide, so a T. Or sorry, this is an A. I guess that is an A. It gets added in, and we see the color there, and the color disappears the moment we actually incorporate it into the DNA. So we're watching in real time the nucleotides being put 
in to the growing DNA strand. We don't need this extra add, take a photo, chop it off, add, take a photo, chop it off. We don't even need to do any of that crap. Let's just let the polymerase do its job. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. These can do about 10,000 bases at a time. The other one was like 1,000. Holy crap. What you can have with this is you could have massive parallel sequencing with it. We could break it up because each of those little wells is tiny. So we could be running the same DNA or fragments of DNA all over the place. And all we have to do is assemble it back together again. SMART, because some people have a lot of fun coming up with these things, stands for single molecule real time, meaning it just looks at, we can see in real time each DNTP, so each nucleotide, each molecule being added in. We can watch the sequencing of every single one of those wells at the exact same time, which is faster and cheaper because you don't need to make a specialized chip than Illumina. Hmm? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. it's the, it's, if you have tunnel vision, that's all it is, is tunnel vision. And the only thing you can see is the active site. So until a nucleotide gets put into that active site, you have no clue what's going on. The moment it comes into the active site, we detect it. And that's why it's noise. The noise is because we have DNTPs floating everywhere. Up, oh, hit the active site. I got to see it. Uh, it's gone. It's just noise. Up, oh, something went into the active site. I can now detect it. Then it runs away. And again, why does it go away? Because we cut it off as part of DNA replication. So can we do better than this? Because again, this kind of needs a machine and you need to have like stuff to go along with this. The answer is, of course. Introducing the Oxford Nanopore. Do many of you happen to have a spare battery, like a portable charger? For a phone or anything? Just checking if any of you do. How big are those? About the size of your phone. That's the size of one of these. Wait, but your phone you can pick up and take it places. Yes, I know. So these are portable. You want to go to the rainforest? You want to start sequencing things that you find out there? You could do easy prep kits, get DNA really fast out of samples, run it right immediately into one of these. Holy crap. So what like fluorescent dyes do you need for these? Fluorescent dyes you have to watch out with light because light will destroy them. This says I don't need none of that. Oxford Nanopore is going to use a protein called hemolysin. Hemolysin is a bacterial toxin that punches holes into cell membranes and it causes your red blood cells to explode. So it's not a nice little protein to have except we use it to make a hole in a membrane. So what happens in Oxford Nanopore is we make artificial membranes. And again, it's just in the little machine. Hemolysin will form these itty bitty holes. And you're going to get millions of these per cell. So again, we're not playing games of hundreds or thousands. We're now playing games in the millions. And each of these is portable and here's the genius of this one everything else that we've been doing we've been using dna replication which means i need parts what if i don't need to make it replicate at all what if i could just shred it open and to just flat out detect 
the nucleotides as they move past. How the hell would you do that? Each nucleotide has a different shape, has a different set of electrical properties, which means each of them conducts electricity just a little bit differently. So what if you could detect the changes in the electrical properties of each nucleotide? Then you can sequence without replication. And that's what this is. So there's going to be a motor protein that's going to be used, which is going to be a helicase. What does helicase do? Do we remember helicase? It's the splitter. It takes double-stranded DNA and it splits it open. Ta-da, that's all we need. We're going to have our hemolysin. We'll add our helicase. Helicase is going to split open the DNA. Inside of the hemolysin, we make this really skinny pore. And all we need to do is detect current differences at the exit. And depending on what current is read, that tells you what nucleotide you're looking at. And again, how big is the sequencer? Your phone. So you do international travel. You're in, an, I don't know, the bird lab. And you want to sequence the birds because, oh, I think these might be new birds that we're finding. How could you do this the old-fashioned way? you got to capture the bird. You're now stressing out the bird. You now need to get blood samples from the bird. Make all sorts of notes to make sure you know what bird this turns out to be from. You then need to get that into cold storage so you can isolate the DNA and then run it through sequencing. What if you could just go there, you have a kit where you add a drop of blood, shaky, 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 and immediately put it inside of, effectively, your cell phone. Done. You will know within a little bit of time, yay, I have good sequence, let the bird go. Move on. It's absolutely brilliant. And this can go millions of bases at a time. Absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. The guy who came up with it, it took him his entire professional career to come up with this idea and to make it so it could work. Could you imagine that? You get a PhD, you work for 30 years, and at the end of the 30 years, you're finally done with your first project. but it's revolutionary. So when are we going to have the versions of these that are an iPhone attachment? You just plug it on into your phone and you can get your own instant reads. Because you know they're working on that. Absolutely they're working on that. All those sequences, what we need to do is assemble it into the genome. We have a class that teaches you how that happens. It's bioinformatics. Uh, it's, it's an ordeal. So we have our genome in fragments. We have the fragments that are sequenced. We now need to find overlaps of those sequences that creates what we call contigs. And then we start to assemble these contigs into bigger and bigger configurations until effectively we say we're done. When, when people announce that we have sequence to genome, what they're telling you actually is they've done this part. Not necessarily this part. So when I graduated from college, it was announced that the human genome was done. 20 years after I graduated from college, they actually finished it. This was published last year. They finally finished properly the human genome. 20 years after they said they finished the genome. Why did it take so long? 
because they were having issues aligning certain parts of the genome and they couldn't get it to work. What parts? Two areas, telomeres and centromeres. Those are where we had issues. Why? Because it's nothing but repetitious DNA. And it turns out sequencing has trouble with repetition. So what did we need to make this work? We needed Oxford nanopore. We needed something where replication isn't going to be the hindrance. Genius, pure genius. So what patterns do we see when we look at genomes? But turns out um, prokaryotes, they're super efficient. They, they got clean, clean genomes. Their genes are nothing but the genes. There's no junk in there whatsoever. If you look at us, eh, roughly 90 to 95% of our DNA is what we would classify as junk, meaning things that are not genes. Vast majority of it turns out to be like 50-ish percent is actually not even human DNA, which is all the more entertaining. Some of the patterns that we've started to gather out of genome analysis is the size of a genome does not tell you how complex the organism is. We wanted to know that we have, when they first did the Human Genome Project, we were convinced that we're going to find hundreds of thousands, if not millions of genes, because humans are clearly the pinnacle of all evolution. There is nothing more complex than us. Clearly, we are the greatest, and our genome should reflect it. No, no, we have actually a eh size genome with an eh number of genes. We tend to see when we look at eukaryotes, there's lots and lots of repetition. But with us, we have a few locations where there's variation, but not as much as what we see in other animals or other mammals or even in other primates or even in other apes. Humans are remarkably similar to each other. And there's a paper that just came out that tried to explain that, but that's not for today. So how can we read these sequences? The reading of sequences is referred to as gene accessions. Gene accessions are easy. All you have to do is subtract. It's a game of subtraction. So if I were to go and look up a DNA sequence, and it's all publicly funded, so it's all public information, what you could look up is things like this about each of the sequences. We could find the CDS. CDS, this is the part that is translated. The mRNA is obviously tr the transcription part. I can get a protein sequence. It's always going to start M, then stuff. But sometimes the word complement appears. The word complement means the gene is on the opposite strand as the reference gene. Meaning, the sequence we talk about is going to be this top one. This top one is going to be 5 prime, 3 prime. If you're told something is complement or complementary when you look at the sequence, you're being told it's down here. But we talk about it by projecting it up to the top. So the numbers are backwards. When you see the word complement, it is a code for you need to read backwards. So how does that work? So 
I had to work on a gene for my masters. This is the entire gene. I had to shrink it down a little bit. That actually, when I put it into Word, so I could make it small enough, so I could, you know, make a screenshot and put it here. Um, I think that's size four font to get it so it could finally fit onto the slide. But if I were to go and hunt for things, I see things that look like this. Where I get a protein sequence, starts with an M. Why does it start with an M? Because AUG codes for methionine. So I'm always going to see M first. I'm going to have where it's going to say mRNA. So all of this is the part that's transcribed. CDS, this is all the part that's translated. What you'll see is we'll have a number, dot, dot, then another number. Each of those is a chunk, an exon, if you will. I'll then have commas, and those commas are the introns. Dot, dot is telling you start and stop of an exon. So there's the exon, and that comma is the intron. Number, number, exon, comma, intron. Dot, dot, exon, comma, intron. Why don't the two match each other? Because it turns out when you have your gene, we turn it into mRNA, we call that with our exons that we have, we have these chunks out here. We gave them names. Do you recall what they are at the start and at the end? They're UTRs, untranslated regions. You're going to have a 5 prime UTR, you have a 3 prime UTR. So what type of problems can we get from these? So here's quickly going through these three examples. So finding the translation start, translation end, transcription start, transcription end, and the UTRs. So here we're just going to see if we can figure out what the numbers are. As a reminder, mRNA is telling us about transcription. CDS, the coding DNA sequence, is going to tell us about translation. So if I want to know when transcription, I'm going to do these out of order. So if I want to know transcription starts, that's actually going to be the first one listed. So that's going to be 85619. Transcription is going to end where this terminates, which is going to be 87865. When we talk about where translation starts and where translation stops, this we can use the CDS to figure out. So the first nucleotide that's going to be translated is going to be 65761. This is part of a codon. And the last one that's going to be translated is going to be 87619. And this is going to be the last um codon translated and it's obviously part of it of note this is not a stop codon and that's because stop codons aren't translated if i want to find the utrs remember that we have a five prime and a three prime utr because we're reading this in order it's going to go 5 prime to 3 prime. And if I were to look at this, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 introns. So what I have, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 introns. Intron 1, intron 2, intron 3, intron 4, intron 5, exon 1, Exon 2, exon 3, exon 4, exon 5, exon 6. To find my UTRs, what I need is this sequence, the chunk that I just highlighted. So that's going to be from where I have transcription 
starting, to where I have translation starting, and I have where I have translation stopping, to where transcription stops. So I need to look at both sequences to figure this out. So the 5' prime UTR is going to start at 85619, and it's going to run until right before where translation starts, which is going to be 85760, because at 85761, I'm now in translation, and that's no longer a UTR, an untranslated region. So for the 3' prime UTR, that's going to be from where translation stops, which is going to be 87620, which is one after we stopped translation, and then that's going to run until the end of transcription, which is 87865. These are just finding what we would call the coordinates. So what if we could ask you about lengths and things like that? So, this one here is a slightly harder example, but it, it's, it's still very, very doable. And all of these problems, so you know, are going to be along the same lines. They're going to seem like, oh no, they're, this one's going to be tricky, and the answer is no, they're all the exact same. The worst trick I can do to you is give you a compliment. So compliment means read it backwards. Meaning, here's my 5 prime end, here's my 3 prime end. Here's my 5 prime end, here's my 3 prime end. So if I ask you what's the length of the first and last exons, what I need to do is find the exons. Typically when we say exons, what we mean to say is coding DNA sequences. So what I need to do is find the first codon, or excuse me, find the first exon. Here's exon one, here's exon two, exon three, exon four, exon five, exon six. So if I do the first and last exons, I just subtract the numbers. So for exon one, I would take one, six, one, four, two, minus one, six, zero, four, four, for exon 6, it would be 13579 minus 13394. And what I'm going to end up getting as a result of this, the first one I'm going to get 98, and the second one I'm going to get 184. These are nucleotides, so I need to list that as a unit, which is nucleotides. There's a problem with this, and the problem is these numbers are wrong. So if I were to ask you, you know, if you were to look at, oh, that's a really bad hand, shame on me. Mm, that thumb still doesn't look right. And we still have a deformed thumb, whatever. So if I were to ask you how many digits are on your hand, and you number them one, two, three, four, five, well, if I said, oh, well, it's clearly gonna be five minus one, and the answer is four, well, you know that's not true because there's five digits on your hand. So how can we make this work where we have the math right? It turns out the numbers 1 and 5 are what we call being inclusive, meaning they are part of the count. So if my ends turn out to be inclusive, meaning they are part of what I'm counting, what I need to do is add in a fudge factor of 1. And the result is I get my 5. Because the numbers that I'm underlining, or I'll highlight these numbers, because these numbers that I'm highlighting are part of the, in, or the exons, because they are components of it, I am being inclusive. So to get the actual length, I need to add another nucleotide. I get 99 nucleotides, and I get 185 nucleotides. So the correct answers are 99 nucleotides for exon 1, 185 nucleotides for exon 6, which is the last exon. How can I find the and go of the last intron? 
So the coordinates of the last intron are found in that comma. So what do I have? Well, I have 1, 3, 5, 7, 8. What comes after that? 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. And then I have 1, 3, 5, 7, or 8, O, oh, dot, dot, dot. This exon is going to begin, or ends actually with 1, 3, 7, O, oh, 3. So right before that, I get 1, 3, 7, O, oh, 2, 1, 3, 7, O, oh, 1. Remember, this is going 5 prime to 3 prime. So this would be my get up. And on the 3 prime end, I get and go. So if I want to know the coordinates of my and go, they would be 1, 3, 5, 8, 0, oh, and 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. 5 prime to 3 prime. Could you have listed 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 1, 3, 5, 8, 0? Oh? Yeah, you could have because we're not necessarily asking for actual orientation. So they are within those two. More properly, you should list things 5 prime to 3 prime. Then you can get problems like this. Find the length of the shortest intron. So the introns, again, are going to be these lengths. So if I were to go and I subtract, so for the exons, what I did was I just took the numbers and I subtracted them. So 16142 minus 16044. That got me 98, so I needed to add one to get 99. And that's because these are inclusive. If I do this for the introns, my introns would be 16044 minus 15730. Well, when I do that subtraction, I'm going to get 124 nucleotides. The catch is these two numbers here are not part of the intron. These are exclusive or not part. So what I actually have to do is get rid of a nucleotide. And I actually get, um, sorry, actually this would get me, I did the math wrong. I'm reading the wrong things. This is actually 314. So when I get rid of one, because it's exclusive, I get 313, which is the correct answer. So what I need to do is figure out the lengths of each of these commas. And again, what you would do is take these numbers here that I'm underlining, subtract big minus small, then get rid of an extra nucleotide because they are exclusive. And when you do that, I'm going to number these one, two, three, four, and five. So again, I'm going to highlight them so it also makes it easier to see what I'm talking about. So when I go through that and I do the subtraction, what I'm going to get, and again, one through five, five prime to three prime, what I'm going to get is 313 nucleotides, 143 nucleotides, 316 nucleotides, 98 nucleotides, and 124 nucleotides. Find the length of the shortest intron. The answer is 98 nucleotides. Which one is it? It turns out to be this one right here is the shortest. How would I figure that out? Again, we just do the subtraction. What other things can we do? So where's AUG? So AUG is the start of translation. Here's the start of translation. So 16142 is going to be the A, but again, we're reading this backwards. There's 5 prime. So 16141 is going to be the U, 16140 is going to be the G. Well, what else could I ask you? I could say, where's the stop codon? The stop codon is going to be found in the mRNA, and it's going to be in the 3' prime UTR, so you know. So my CDS stops at 13394, so I go 13393, 13392, 
one, three, three, nine, one. This chunk right here is my stop codon. It is part of the three prime UTR. This chunk over here is part of my coding DNA sequence. I could also ask you how many codons. So if you need to know the number of codons, I need to know the lengths of all exons. Once you have the length of number of exons, I need to convert the length into codons. Hopefully you remember that there are three nucleotides per codon. There is still another trick involved with this, but I'm going to leave you to figure that out because it might show up on a quiz. But there is another trick in there that's needed to get to the final answer, which is how many codons are there? I've given you 90% of the way. You just need to come up with the last 10%.